Hello and uh, welcome to TK Services. So today's topic uh, is business valuation and uh, how do we do business valuation? I am going to be using the modus of financial modeling. So basically I will use Excel and some smart techniques and tools that Excel provides and apply them in determining the value of a business. The intended coverage for today's topic is first of all you must understand what is value very important. The other thing which you need to understand is how do you determine this value, right? Now there are various methods of doing business valuation but I am going to be covering in today's video the free cash flow to the firm method, right? And third and the most important part or the crux of this particular session is building up a model starting from scratch and then finally ending up testing the model and playing with the numbers. Before you go to the valuation exercise, you can see for yourself, we are using a blank screen, right? It's completely blank so that users understand every bit of the modeling exercise that I'm intending to do to value a particular business. Now let's come to the first trigger point of this particular exercise, understanding what is value or rather what is the price. Now let's say you go into a market and you try to pick up a pair of jeans for yourself and you go to three stores, maybe in one, one of the stores the jeans cost you 3000 bucks, the other one costs you 3500 and there's another one which costs you 4500 rupees. Now there's something which goes into your mind and maybe you pick up the jeans which costs you 3500 rupees. Now why that jeans? Why that pair of jeans? What was so special in that? Something clicked here in your brain and maybe the 3500 jeans, you thought that the value that you are getting out of purchasing or making an investment in that pair of jeans is far greater than the price that you are expecting to pay for that pair of jeans. So as long as the benefit from that particular investment exceeds the cost, you will pay that particular price to acquire that particular asset. The same thing applies to business. So will it therefore be wrong to say that the value of a business is nothing but the present value of all future recurring benefits that you expect from that particular business. Now this is the crux of the valuation exercise. Now the first thing that the uh, users will be asked to put. I'm just going to put down some values and we will determine these values later on. So let's say I take values of inputs. So the inputs that I'm going to take are mentioned on this particular screen on the left hand side. So rev zero basically means the revenue for the base year or the current revenue that is achieved by the target firm. Then the other input which you might require from the user is what is the growth rate in the revenues? What is the growth rate, the annual growth rate that you are expecting in the revenues? That means your revenues are expected to grow by a certain percentage year on year basis. The third thing which you will probably ask them to input is the forecasting period. Another input which you might ask the user to input may be the contribution margin which the firm expects to achieve in percentage terms. Then how much is the OPEX as a percentage of, let's keep that as a percentage of sales. Now the other thing that you might also want the user to enter is let's say uh, the asset turnover ratio. So I mentioned that as ATO. Now let's begin by entering these inputs and let's start constructing this particular model. Now let's start with the first thing that the user will enter. Remember when the user has to enter the values, he must be prompted the space where he needs to enter the values. And normally in business language, you will always hear that the business nomenclature for inputs is highlighted by a color and more often than not this color is yellow. So the first thing that he needs to enter is the forecasting period. Now 
you need to be very careful in such kind of sheets because you can't leave such cells open right you need to restrict typically it's very difficult to identify a forecast beyond 5 year period but in valuation exercise sometimes firms can go up to a 10 year forecasting period also but but speaking by experience especially in such dynamic circumstances that exist today in business it's very difficult to forecast or to have the ability to forecast beyond a 5 year period right so probably you can set a cap so that the user cannot enter an obnoxious value like a 100 year forecasting period maybe we'll set a cap at a 10 year forecasting period so this sheet will keep as model and then we'll create a data sheet right so the, in the data sheet the first thing that we will do is put down the years or rather let's put down the forecasting period right now this could be let's say we put a cap that he can't exceed 10 years so we'll give the user an option to choose from amongst these periods before that we must give a name to this particular selection if you look here at the moment this selection has no name but we can always name this particular selection by using the name manager function in the formulas so if you go to formulas name manager new it will automatically pick up the header which is the forecasting period and it puts up the selection so just press ok the moment you press ok and close it you see that it has picked up a name for the selection now this selection has a name and this selection is called the forecasting period right now we go here and we'll give the user the flexibility to choose from the drop down so i go here in the data validation and i say allow list is equal to forecasting right here you go so now if you see the user now has the ability to choose the number of years from this particular drop down okay now we have to make the model in such a way remember a model is comprising of three different parts so let me illustrate those parts to you so if you draw it in the form of a circle here this is a circle so there are three distinct parts in this circle so the first part is your input cell so basically a model will have a specific space allotted for the user to put his inputs then there is something which you probably cannot see as a user but there is integrated or embedded within the model itself the process so based on your inputs and based on the formula or the modeling that you do the model is capable to process the inputs to get you the desired output and your output is therefore the third critical part of your model so a financial model should typically consist of an input a process and an output functionality or rather a space so let's go to the now mind you we are still in the input space we have not yet begun the processing and there is no output for us to see the most efficient financial model is one which gives least hassle to the user it should be extremely user friendly and the user should be able to understand and based for example this particular functionality that we gave here makes it easy for the user to understand that he has to choose between 1 to 10 years so the efficiency of the model will be built by some of these things right now as he picks up this data there should also be columns made for years because we have to analyze and interpret data based on the forecasts available and the forecasts are generally in the form of a pnl or a snapshot cash flow uh, statement which will then be used to analyze and get an auto arrive at the value of a firm now i will put here so just see what i am doing and i'll tell you why i am doing this so since we have 11 years i am going to take this from 0 to 11 10 years so i am going to take it from 0 to 11 now why i am taking 11 
I'll tell you shortly. Okay. Now you don't know the user may enter three years, four years, five years, etc. You don't know what the user is going to enter. But let's see enters three years, then there should be three columns appearing here for the user to enter data. If he shows seven years, then there should be seven columns appearing here for the user to enter the data. So that should happen automatically. As I told you, this is again a part of an efficient modeling process. So how am I going to do this? I am going to put a formula here is equal to if this number is greater than this number, then pick up this number else this. So let's see if this particular function will work. Before that, I just need to freeze this cell so that when I drag, the formula still works. Yeah, it is working. So if you see here, it's going up to the seventh column. Now, when I select nine, it should go up to the ninth column. Very good. So now you see the formula is working. Now what we will do is we will hide we will not hide it maybe, we will just put it in white color so that the user does not know that there is something something there and we will encrypt the sheet later on so that the user can't enter values in these cells. Now 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 does not look very good. So what I am going to do here is I am going to put Y. So concatenate, I will use a concatenate function concatenate y for the year and then this cell. I'll put that here and now I will drag this particular formula. Okay, So now you get y1, y2, y3. So let, let's say the user enters 10 years. So if you look here, now you have 10 columns which have got populated. Year 1 to year 10. Can you see that? Let's say he wants to enter shorter forecasting period, maybe five years. So you've got Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4, Y5, and these are all blank, right? So that flexibility is accorded to the user. Let's keep 10 years for this particular exercise that we are going to do. All right. So now let's start with the building up of the model. So we'll start with the revenues. Uh, we will also keep some values for the base year. So I will put that as base year for year zero. Now base year revenues is what the user will enter. We'll give him uh, instructions maybe to enter in crores. So let's say the user enters 2500 crores. The moment he enters that here, this figure will get populated. And the moment he enters the growth rate, again, we can always give him quick instructions like this in crores and we we'll do it in such a way that these comments are visible so that it looks neat so he knows that he has to enter in crores now same way we will also ask the user to enter the growth rate in percentage terms okay now whatever instruction you want to give to the user you can give it so that the user knows exactly what he enters and he knows that if he doesn't adhere to this protocol, the model will not function in the manner in which it is expected to function. So let's say he puts a 8% growth rate for revenue. Now why is that growth rate important? What we are going to do is we are going to simply put up last year's cell into 1 plus your growth rate. So this will give you the revenues for the future years. And I'm going to freeze this cell and then drag it. So when you freeze and then drag, you should get your revenues for all the years. Okay. Now, after that, the next important part is the contribution margin. So again, he will be asked to put the contribution margin in percentage terms. And we'll put show comments so that comments remains visible. So let's say the user enters contribution margin of 40%. If the contribution margin is 40%, the variable costs or the direct costs will be 
So I will just put for the B is here multiplied by 1 minus variable cost, uh, 1 minus contribution margin. So that is your variable cost. And I will please this cell and then I will drag it. So I get my variable cost for all the years. Now what I am going to do is I am going to arrive at my contribution margin. Okay. So let's see my contribution margin in this case will be revenue minus variable cost and that remains same for across all the years. You can note here the contribution margin is 40% of the sales, right, based on the requirements of the user. The next thing we are going to do is we are going to ask the user to enter OPEX as a percentage of sales. So let's say the OPEX percentage is 20%. So now we need to put the OPEX 20% of sales. So that is this value into this value. Now remember, when you're building up the model, you might have a tendency to hard code 20% here, which will be wrong. Remember, a most efficient model is one which doesn't hard code anything. There is no hard coding. It's purely based on linkages. So we will not write 20% here. We will write into C11 so that if the user later changes his mind and wants to make it 40, 30 or 10%, the model automatically does all the calculation, right? So we will never ever hard script anything on the model, right? And now we will drag this, you get the OPEX. Once you get the OPEX, the next thing obviously logically is the EBITDA. So now you have the EBITDA, which is nothing but your contribution margin minus your OPEX. Now from the EBITDA, the next thing that we need to reduce is the depreciation. And that's why you will observe, I have asked the user to put the asset turnover ratio, right? When you put the asset turnover ratio, it gives you an idea of the total assets. Again, the total asset turnover ratio is always in decimal. So let's say the user enters an asset turnover ratio of 0 0.8. Assuming that it's a highly efficient organization, the assets are used efficiently which means every rupee of asset will generate a sales of 0.8. Asset turnover ratio is basically sales upon assets, right? Now sales upon assets is 0.8. So assets will therefore be, I will write down the assets here. Assets will be therefore sales divided by asset turnover ratio, right? So this is how you get your assets. And now I'll freeze this. And now I will drag this. Okay, so you get your assets for all the years. Now, if you remember, since the asset turnover ratio is constant, the assets will also grow proportionately as your revenues are intending to grow within the forecasting period. A very important functionality. This will have an impact on depreciation, this will have an impact on capex also. So now okay, let's say the firm is adopting a straight line method of depreciation. Okay, now how do you determine the depreciation? So first of all, I will ask the user to enter the useful lives of all assets being acquired in years. And let's say the, the user enters 10 years as the useful life. That means all assets will have a useful life of 10 years. Based, this is basically maybe the useful life of the assets in the industry with, to which this particular user belongs to. So now what we are going to do is we are now going to find out the depreciation of each year. Right? Remember these assets were used to, so assets of 3125 were used to generate this revenue for the next year. 3375 generated this revenue. 3,605 is expected to generate this revenue, right? So the assets at the end of the year are assumed to be generating the revenues for that particular year, right? Next year. Now, how are we going to find out the depreciation? Now, assuming that this particular assets existed, these are your base, this is not a part of your forecast. So the depreciation for this particular year, what I'm going to do, I'm going to prepare a kind of a movement schedule so this is your closing balance of the assets. Then you have your depreciation. I'm going to write as dip. 
and then you have your opening balance of the assets so closing balance plus depreciation minus opening balance should give you your desired or intended capex or capital expenditure rather i would say implicit capex in the estimation exercise now how are we going to find out the depreciation so the depreciation for the first year will be this divided by useful life which is 312.5 one change that i'm going to do is i am going to make sure that all these numbers are rounded off so there is no because when you are doing such a valuation exercise there is no need for us to be so hard fast about decimals right so you have closing balance and now you have depreciation so let's start with year 1 so the year 1 depreciation will be equal to the base year depreciation so the base year depreciation we just saw was closing balance divided by its for life of 10 years right again i am going to round this off and this is your depreciation right now what about the year 1 forecasted now we are moving to the forecast so what about the forecast depreciation for year 1 the forecast depreciation for year 1 will not change because this is the assets which you are going to use in the next year for generating the revenue for the next year so whatever capex you are anyways doing is we are assuming it to be at the end of year 1 So there is no change in depreciation for year one per se. So the depreciation for year one will be three one three, right? Your opening balance is three one two five. So what is the implicit capex? Implicit capex will be closing balance plus depreciation minus opening balance, which is five sixty three. Now let me explain this to you in a slightly different way, and this is how students understand it better. Now, if you draw a T form, right? Let's say you have your T form here. You have your opening. Suppose this is your assets account. I will write here assets. This is your opening balance. You put your opening balance in this box, right? Here you will do your depreciation, which you charge off from the asset and transfer it to the P&L. Now you will also have. after reducing depreciation you have closing balance right so this part here should be your capex remember this and this the total has to be equal so therefore i can say that closing balance plus depreciation minus opening balance should be giving you your capex so that is what we have done here closing balance plus depreciation minus opening balance will be your capex Here, closing balance plus depreciation minus opening balance is your capex, and that's exactly what I have done in the formula. Closing balance plus depreciation minus opening balance is your capex. What about the depreciation for year two? Now, this is where we need to be careful. The depreciation for year two will obviously be equal to this depreciation, the last year's depreciation for sure. Plus, you have also made an acquisition of. 563 right so this will also have a useful life of 10 years so you will have an incremental depreciation of because these are the assets you have used you have used this much of assets you have used these assets to basically generate revenues for the next year so the depreciation will be 313 which is last year's depreciation plus all the assets which you acquired at the end of last year you will use it this year so this year's depreciation will be this plus this assets divided by the useful life which is 369 right so 313 plus the incremental depreciation that comes from the new assets which are acquired last year opening balance you can get from here and capex we have already fed in the formula now what i am going to do here all i need to do is i need to freeze this particular cell right and then i just need to drag this right here and all your capex your depreciation everything is coming right here you get it so now i am going to put the depreciation figures for year 1 all we need to do is just link it to the cells above and you should get all your depreciation forecasts in this particular cell in your pnl statement 
So once you reduce your depreciation, you are at your operating income level, which is called as EBIT, which will be EBITDA minus depreciation. And that should give you your EBIT, which I'm going to put it here, right? So I get my EBIT now. Now comes another important part, which is your interest. Let's now also find out how much will be the interest. Remember, assets will also always be equal to liabilities, right? So now we need to be very careful here because if you are going to have new assets, obviously you will have new borrowings also. Now let's say the firm is mandated to use a particular debt equity ratio. So here comes the part where the user will be asked to input a debt equity ratio. Let's say he inputs a debt equity ratio of 1.5. So if I have a debt equity ratio of 1.5, right? A debt equity ratio of 1.5, what does it mean? It means if my equity value is X, my debt value is 1.5X. So that means my total capital employed will be 1.5X plus X which is 2.5x, right? So 2.5x will be equal to your total assets or assets by 2.5 will give you your equity. So what I'm going to do is I am going to now break up these assets into debt and equity. So here I have debt and I have equity, right? If you look at what we did, so remember, 2.5x is equal to your capital employed. So just for assumption sake, 2.5x is equal to 3125, which is your first year's assets, right? A base year's assets. So x will be how much? x will be 3125 divided by 2.5. 2.5 is nothing but 1 plus the equity ratio. So I'm just going to get my value of equity like that. So equity is therefore asset divided by one plus debt equity ratio, which is here. So this is how I'm going to get my equity. And now, since your debt equity ratio is remaining constant, I'm going to just drag this so that your increasing levels of equity are also going here. Now, what about your debt? Now, if your equity is X, debt is 1.5 times x, so you will just do this into 1.5 and you get your debt. Right? So now you can check this plus this is equal to your assets, this plus this is equal to your assets, this plus this is equal to your assets, etc. And now we have got debt and equity, which will give you your total assets. Right? Or your capital employed. Mind you, if your debt is increasing, that means your borrowing cost will also increase. Okay, now what is your interest? Or you will need to ask the user to enter the interest rate. So let's say the interest rate he enters is six or let's say seven percent for your debt, right? So this is your interest rate, which is seven percent. Okay, now the interest for the base year will obviously be your debt multiplied by 7%. This is your interest for the first year. Let's keep a slightly lower percent, assuming that the bank has a good relationship with them and they have financed it earlier also. It's slightly lower, right? So this is your interest. Now, also these revenues need to be slightly higher so i'm just changing the revenues part of it let's say our base year revenues were not poor let's keep this as four thousand okay this is much better so that you have sufficient profits so now this is your interest so let's revert back to our original 2500 figure where we started so that you're comfortable with these numbers so we have an interest of 113, which is nothing but your total debt into your interest percentage here. Right? Now this 1875 of debt was used to generate sales or used for the next year's calculation, right? Or next year's 
it was a finance for your next year. Similarly, 2025 was your finance available for the year 2. 2187 was the finance available for year 3. Same way, right? So the last year's closing balance is the capital that you're employing for the next year's operations. My interest for year 1 is just going to be the same as the interest for year 0 because ultimately I have used this capital to generate this particular sales rate. I have used this capital to generate or to conduct the operations and to generate the revenues for this particular year. Right? However, from year 2 it changes. What will be my interest for year 2? That will be the capital or the debt at the end of the first year multiplied by your interest rate. Which is your. It will be the same for the, for the remaining years. All I need to do is just freeze the interest rate cell and I put it here like this. So now I have got my interest also. I am going to reduce my interest and get profit before taxes which is this minus this. So this is your PBTs. Now after PBTs the next thing is taxes. So we need to now ask the user what is your tax rate. So I will put this here. So let's say the user says a 30% tax bracket. So I am going to simply apply PBT multiplied by tax rate that, that should give you your tax liability. Right? There you go. So once you have your tax liability, sorry, it's because I haven't frozen the cell. You put that this thing happened, so now you will understand why I need to freeze the cell. Because I didn't freeze, the cell shifted and you got different zero values. However, if you freeze a cell, now you will get the correct values of all your taxes. Now remember, in this particular cases, the firm is actually generating losses and the reasons for the high losses is the extremely high depreciation figures because the useful life is short. Let's keep a little larger useful life and see what happens. If you keep it 20 years, you see that it's much better. You have all positive figures. So let's keep it at 20 years to save that headache. So assuming that this particular, these particular assets have useful life of 20 years, your depreciation figures will come, will come down and therefore you have profits. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce these taxes and arrive at PAT. So PBT minus taxes. So if I reduce this, I get PAT. Profit after tax, which is nothing but your net income. Right now, what will PAT help us to achieve? Let's say the user inputs that this particular firm has 18 crore shares here. So we will ask the user to input in crores the way we did here. Number of shares in crores. I write here in crores. Right, and I put it as show comments. So let's say the user says there are 18 crore shares available, right? So once you have your pack, you should be able to get your EPS, earnings per share. So earnings per share for the base year will be packed divided by number of shares, which is 8.99 in this case, right? Now, we will also ask the user to enter the retention ratio for the base year. So let's say the retention ratio is 0 0.4, which means for every profit that they are every rupee of profit that they are generating, 40% of it is retained, 60% of this is distributed as dividends. So that means my DPS or dividend per share will be this multiplied by 1 minus retention ratio, which is 5.4, right? If you are going to the next year, so this particular calculation will change. And why is this required? Because we need to arrive at the forecasted uh, dividend, right? Now you already have the current dividend. Remember, now we are going to arrive at cost of equity. Now, cost of equity, friends, will not be a input that will you will get from the model, right? So first of all, let's also ask the user to enter the growth rate for 
dividends and prices the growth rate for dividends and prices there you go growth rate for dividends and prices let's say the user says that there is a 5% growth he expects on dividends and prices every year so now you know the formula for cost of equity the formula for cost of equity is like this let me for the benefit of the audience i will be using the gordon's formula and as per the gordon's formula the cost of equity is b1 which is a forecasted dividend for next year divided by current market price p0 plus the growth rate for dividends and prices now you know what is d1 right do you know no you don't because this is d0 remember we have this for the base year so can i also rewrite this formula as d0 multiplied by 1 plus growth rate divided by p0 plus g that should give you your cost of equity so ladies and gentlemen here you will get a first arrived at value so our first arrived at value as i told you d0 into 1 plus g so this is your d0 multiplied by 1 plus growth rate divided by current market price so you should ask the user to enter the current market price and the whole thing again you add g right so i'll put a bracket here so that the formula is less confusing now here we will ask the user to enter the current market price of the shares let's say the user enters that the current market price of the shares is 125 rupees now what should be the cost of equity cost of equity will be therefore again i go back to the formula d0 multiplied by 1 plus growth rate divided by current market price so this is d1 by p0 plus your growth rate that should give you your cost of equity which you see here is 9.53 percent that gives you your cost of equity right now let's also find out the cost of debt it's already here it's six percent so cost of debt ladies and gentlemen you already know that for the weighted average cost of capital we will take effective cost of debt and effective cost of debt is cost of debt into 1 minus tax rate so interest into 1 minus tax rate so that gives you your post tax cost of debt okay now let's arrive at the weights you know the weights the debt weight is 1.5 divided by 1 plus debt equity ratio right and equity weight is 1 minus debt weight which is 0.4 and VAC will be some product costs and their respective weights so here you get your weighted average cost of capital which is 6.33 percent okay so this is our first output of the model so i want to put it in a separate color so this is your weighted average cost of capital ladies and gentlemen and why is this important so i'm just going to shift my eps and dps for the base here to the left so that it doesn't interrupt with my other calculations so i'm going to now model the fcff now what is the fcff you know the formula ladies and gentlemen the formula for free cash flow to the firm is net income plus i into 1 minus tr plus non cash charges minus capex minus working capital changes right now what i'm going to do here is just to keep this thing simple we are just going to take capex and not working capital investments so let's arrive at fcf so net income plus interest multiplied by 1 minus tax rate why do we do 1 minus tax rate because remember fcf is unlevered cash flow it nullifies the effect of interest so if you do not have interest you cannot take the benefit tax benefit of interest also because the more the interest the less are the profits the less are the tax liability so having interest will have a reduction in your tax liability so if you are removing the effect of interest you should remove the benefit that you're getting out of the interest also so that's why i into 1 minus tr plus non-cash charges which is here and then 
minus capex you know the capex now remember we need to do this calculation from year one not from base year so i just do it start doing it here so net income plus i interest multiplied by one minus tax rate the tax rate is here plus non cash charges right minus capex capex is here you get your free cash flow to the firm and now i'm going to just freeze this cell because if you don't freeze your answer may not be right so i will just drag this and here i get the free cash flows right now this remember this is going negative because you have extremely high levels of capex in the later years that's why this is particularly going negative right now if you were to acquire this business you will see that you will not be very convinced with this forecast because the free cash flow to the firm is on a declining trend and that's because of the huge capex that you are considering that is the reason why this is going negative so let me play around with the numbers a little bit if i keep a 25 year is for life it's much better yeah so this is better so obviously if i use a larger useful life the capex part is going to come down a little and because your capex part is going to come down a bit too you're getting a better cash flow remember i'm not doing any adjustment i'm just trying to make the model simple for you to understand you need to understand the essence of the model and the essence of the valuation exercise because if you use negative cash flows the entire purpose of valuation gets defeated so just to make sure that you understand the essence behind a valuation exercise i just want to keep the numbers as positive we can discuss the complications around negative as we go along in the model but this as for the moment this is your free cash flows to the firm right so now how will we discount these free cash flows to the firm we will discount the free cash flows using the discounting factors remember this is free cash flow to the firm firm consists of debt providers of debt capital as well as equity shareholders since it consists of both providers of debt capital and equity shareholders you need to take the cash flow which is available to all so this that's why you use free cash flow to the firm and therefore the cost of capital should also include both debt and equity and therefore to make it commensurate we will use weighted average cost of capital right and that is why we found out vac in the first place so now let's quickly find out the discounting factors so discounting factors is 1 divided by 1 plus weighted average cost of capital to the power of year 1 by 1 plus r to the power of n here is your year and then i just need to freeze this particular cell which has your vac and now i need to drag this ahead okay and i'll keep it as three decimal places so now you have your discounting factors so i will take the present value of all the cash flows which is nothing but your fcff multiplied by discounting factors so you get your present value of all these cash flows right now remember friends this let's draw a timeline okay now this is extremely important for you to understand so please be very careful here when we are valuing a business let's say this is your forecasting period let's for the for a purpose of theory let's say you have a 5 year forecasting period now you have modeled cash flows for these 5 years 1 2 3 4 5 5 now your business does not end here does it no your business will carry on even further so but it's your forecasting ability which ends here it's your forecasting ability which stops here but the benefits are going to come even after that so you need to have some value placed for this part of benefits also and that value is called as the terminal value so if you want to buy the business you need to be prepared to pay the value that the business is going to give you in this period which is within your forecasting period plus also the value beyond the forecasting period and that's why the concept of terminal value becomes so very important remember for the terminal value we are going to use the same gordons concept you know that the gordons concept is like this e0 is d1 divided by ae minus g that is your gordons constant noted formula remember 
if your dividend, if you need to find out the current market price, you have to use the forecasted dividend. Now we need to find out the terminal value at the end of the forecasting period. So I'll just rewrite the formula. In, we need to find out the terminal value at the end of the forecasting period, which is at the end of the 10th year, which should be equal to the free cash flows instead of dividends, because when you're looking at one stock, it's just the price and the dividend balance. Looking at the firm, it is free cash flow to the entire firm. So if this is 10, this will be 11 divided by instead of cost of equity, we are going to look at VAT because we are taking FCFF and minus G, right? So TV10 should be equal to FCFF 11 divided by VAT minus G. We are simply use the Gordon's constant growth formula here. So let's quickly now find out the terminal value at the end of year, at the end of the forecasting period. So the terminal value at the end of the forecasting period is equal to FCFF. Now, if you have 10 into, for that, we need to now ask the user for the growth rate in cash flows. So, I am going to write this as growth rate in FCF. And normally, we are a little conservative by my experience. So, let's take a 2% growth rate here. So, what will be your terminal value? You don't know FCF 11, but you know that FCF 10, which is this one, multiplied by 1 plus growth rate is in FCF 11 divided by VAC minus growth rate. Right? That should be equal to your terminal value. So you get your terminal value here. Now you need to find out the present value of this terminal value, which is nothing but your terminal value multiplied by the discounting factor. So this one. Right, and you get the terminal value. Now, these numbers need to be added up to get the value of the business. So, I'm just going to highlight it in a separate shade. So, this is the one. So, this will give you my value of the firm as on today's terms because I'm contemplating an investment in a firm on today's terms. So, value of the firm. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, will be sum of all these benefits that you are expecting in today's terms. 629 crores is the value of the firm. Right? Now, if 629 crores is the value of the firm, this is how you calculate the enterprise value. So, if you were to quote this uh, value of the firm, if you want to if you want to buy this value, if, if you want to buy out this firm, this is the price that you need to pay for buying out the firm. Remember, value of the firm is value of debt plus value of equity. So if you're buying out the firm, you're buying it out from the equity shareholder. So you typically reduce your book value of debt here to get the value that you need to pay to the equity shareholders. But for now, we will just keep this as the value of the firm, right? So now what you are representing is you are representing the target. And the target says, you know, you are a consultant or an advisor or a part of the merchant banking team and the CFO of the target says, no, no, this is not the valuation I expect. I expect nothing less than 1000 crores. How, what, what, what he is going to say is, I need a valuation of 1000 crores. He needs to know from you, tell me what should be my revenue figure so that I achieve a valuation of 1000 crores. Remember, these are all independent variables. If you change any of these independent variables, this value will change, right? And that's the beauty of modeling. So, for example, if I change my revenue to 4000 crores, all of this changes and the value of the firm becomes 820 crores. If I further change my contribution margin to 60%, this again changes and the value of the firm becomes 7353 crores, right? All of this will have an effect on the final valuation of the firm, right? Now, CFO says, tell me the what should be the revenue for the base year to achieve a valuation of 2,500 crores bare minimum. 2,500 crores is the value that he's looking at. What you, there's a functionality in Excel which is called as what if analysis, goal seek. If you use the goal seek function, you set this cell to what the CFO asks you. So 2,500 crores is what you want. And by changing the independent variable, which is revenue. So if you do that, 
you should be able to get your value of 2500 crores. So in a split like maybe like five seconds, you are able to tell him that, sir, I need a minimum Bayesian revenue of 334 crores as Bayesian revenue to be able to get a valuation of 2500 crores. Okay. Now, obviously, this is the, the reason for that is if the revenue comes down, you acquire lesser assets, you get higher cash flows, your valuation obviously becomes disproportionately higher. So this is one of the modality. We discussed two or three things. One, you played around with the number and you saw that you change any of the independent variables. All your dependent variables will change. Right. So now the, you, you can also use some sort of a sensitivity testing here. So I'm going to create some scenarios. Again, if you go to the data, what if analysis and you discuss with the CFO of the target and the target says, OK, you know what? I just go back to the original figure. So. Yeah, and let's keep it a little more. Uh, let's keep it at thousand. So let's say four nine three five crores is thousand crores was the revenue. Four nine three five crores is what the value of the firm is. Now from this, you will reduce the value of debt. I told you we need to reduce the value of debt to get the value of equity. So let's reduce the value of debt. The value of debt you already know, 750 in this case. So if you reduce that, you get the value of equity. And therefore, value of equity will be equal to 4185 crores. Now, assuming the CFO is happy with this valuation, but now he says, okay, you know what? This is a very aggressive estimate. I might not achieve this estimate. So tell me what is my best case and worst case valuation figure that I should be prepared for when I'm meeting the acquirers. So you help him build this by way of a scenario manager, which Excel gives you. So let's add the scenario. So let's say the worst case, you know that we just saw that contribution margin is the most sensitive factor. So let's take worst case for contribution margin and contribution margin is in this, this cell here. And press OK and he says the worst case I'm going to get a 30% contribution margin. Right? That's the worst case. Add another scenario. Best case contribution margin. Best case contribution margin press OK and he says the best contribution margin that I can get is 70%. Okay. And these are your two cases. Just press sorry and just press summary. And we'll use the value of equity as a summary. If you look here, if at the current values you are having an equity value of 4185 crores, which you just saw, but if the worst case scenario comes to be true, you see the drop in the valuation. It's it's magnanimous. Whereas if you arrive at your best case, you know that 5,500 crores is what you can look at. So you can simp you can also do this permutations and combinations with each of these independent variables and try and play around with the numbers to see how a target is valued. So guys, this in short, rather not short, actually it's a marathon video, but this will this video was essential to tell you three or four key learnings. And let's kind of quickly do a recap and do and try and see what we learned out of this exercise. What did we learn? Number one, what how a model is built. Second, you know, you also learned that you need to make the model efficient to reduce the hassle for the users. And to make it more efficient, you need to do thorough linkages so that you change any one of these independent variable, the model will give you results in like split seconds. Third, you also understood the concept of free cash flow to the firm. Fourth, you also learned functionality of goal seek. For example, if you need a particular valuation, what is the revenue for the base year or what is the contribution margin that you're looking at or you want to look at. Fifth, it also you also learned the scenario manager and how it helps you to do sensitivity or scenario testing. So all of this will help you as an advisor or maybe the target or maybe the acquirer, all these teams to get prepared for the negotiation exercise. And that's how my dear friends valuation works and you will see how critical Excel in that application and the tools, applying the tools of Excel is for this valuation exercise. 
leave alone the concepts. Concepts, of course, are extremely important, but to apply these concepts, you need to use the smart tools of Excel and be a winner in the evaluation exercise. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. Stay tuned to my uh, you know, my YouTube channel Concept Canvas, and you will get to watch many more videos around varied topics. Happy learning. Thank you very much.